Okay. So for our speakers, it's uh, Someda Takashi, Takeshi, yeah, Someda Takashi, Takashi, Someda Takeshi, Takashi Sans. <laughs> uh, he's uh, he's from our one of our sponsors, Hackers, and he's the CTO. And uh, Hackers is a very generous sponsor for us this year too. So please visit their booth when you have time. And uh, yeah, let's welcome the speaker. Thank you. Oh, can I use this for? Oh, uh, uh, no. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you have. Can I use? Yeah. Uh, oh. Hello, hello. Okay, um, first of all, uh, thank you for joining to my session today. I, I really appreciate it for you. And I hope you can enjoy my talk today. So uh, let me briefly introduce myself again. I'm Takash, uh, coming from Japan. I'm working as a CTO of Hakalus, which is a AI startup, so to say. And our main customer or main business field is uh, medical and manufacturing. So uh, to do business or to provide solution in this area, um, we need to, how do I say, uh, the, tackle with some sort of the problem to make AI system. So today I'm going to talk about that, that kind of things. So the key takeaway, key takeaways today is, uh, the first one is a basic concept of sparse modeling. So uh, let me do some quick survey here. So please raise your hand if you have experience of using sparse modeling before. Okay, one, two, three, four. Okay, have you ever heard of the name of sparse modeling? Okay, a little more people. Okay, then I think, yeah, my topic will be suitable for you. I'd like, I'm very happy to introduce this uh, the interesting te technology to you with some concrete example of the image and the time series data analysis. So in the previous sessions, um, some uh, image analysis technology using Bayesian and uh, the CNN and other technology was introduced. And uh, in my session, I I'd like to give some similar e example to you. And uh, lastly, yeah, this is PyCon. So I'd like to give you some Python uh, the code example using our own open source library named uh, SPM image. So uh, let's begin. So before jumping into the technical details of sparse modeling, I'd like to start with uh, talking about the problem, what we need to uh, tackle with. So first one is pretty much common one, a uh, black box problem. So some of you may already know uh, the AI made by the state of the art technology like uh, deep learning, or uh, the latest uh, the machine learning algorithm uh, is so-called black box AI, which means that AI built by that technology cannot answer questions like this. The, uh, the first one is, uh, why do I get this result? In other words, why AI gives me this result? And second one, as you know, uh, the, the from technical perspective, yeah, AI can make mistakes, right? So, because yeah, basically, uh, the, when they see the data, unknown data, which they don't see in the training phase, it can make it can make mistake. Well, lastly, this is sometimes the most important question for, for example, doctors or quality assurance manager at factory. If they see some mistakes by AI, they are supposed to fix that issue to prevent the same problem from happening again. So if AI cannot answer these questions, even if the AI shows super, super fascinating performance in terms of the accuracy or precision, the human cannot use AI in business situation. So there are several uh, the active discussion about how to make AI explainable or interpretable. And as far as I know, there are two major approach for it. The first one is post hoc explain a given AI model, 
which means actually you don't touch inside of the given AI. Rather, you are trying to out understand the AI behavior from outside. So uh, how, can I, how can we do that? So for instance, if you put the information in, if you put the input data to the given AI, the AI give you, will give you the result, right? And then you will change some part of the input. Then you will see, you will observe different output from AI. You will do that, this kind of things, uh, the, sometimes again. Then you can get, you can guess some internal behavior of the AI. This is how uh, we do to understand the uh, AI from outside. So uh, there are several methods called line or sharp uh, using this approach. The other one is to use the interpretable model. Luckily, there are several uh, the machine learning algorithms uh, that is superhuman friendly like logistic regression or decision tree or other tree-based approach. So basically, uh, so for instance, a decision tree is quite obvious and understandable method because it will give you the tree structure from the, uh, uh, the data and each node has some condition. Okay, uh, then if the age is uh, larger than 20, then go to there or go to there or something else. So basically, uh, these models are quite understandable. However, the trade-off is the performance. So these uh, classical uh, method doesn't have uh, capability of handling compli complicated nature of the data that deep learning or other state-of-the-art method can do. So um, yeah, actually, the, as I said, there are the still at the very active discussion in this field, and uh, the just 30 minutes is not enough to talk about all of them. So I just wanna uh, introduce some good presentation slide found in the slide, uh, slide share. So if you have interested in this area, uh, the please uh, refer to that slide. So in our case, uh, we are trying to take the second approach with sparse modeling. I, I want to talk about some concrete example later on. So other typical problem of making AI nowadays is data issue. The first one is tiny data set. So um, as I said, yeah, we are working with yeah, hospital or doctors or pharmaceutical companies to make uh, uh, the AI for medical field. But yeah, one of the biggest problem is collecting data is literally really hard because if you go to if you you are going to build some AI for some specific disease even the largest hospital in Japan only have for instance 200 or 300 the disease record in a year which is not su sufficient to build AI right so uh, in this case, there are several approach like uh, data augmentation, or if you are using deep learning, you can you might be able to use transfer learning to make to, to build an AI model uh, instead of building AI model from scratch. And then next problem is missing values. So uh, yeah, this is also same to uh, the. This is quite commonly uh, the seen in medical or healthcare uh, the the region. So, for instance, uh, we are working with yeah, uh, the another uh, the medical device maker who makes a kind of the medical device to measure uh, blood pressure or heart rate or those kind of the information from your body. And uh, some patient are asked to measure this kind of information every day. But nobody measures that kind of information every day. So we are seeing so many missing values of this information. So we need to handle with this kind of the missing value problem. So the major approach to, this, to solve this is imputation. So put the mean value or the max value or mean value or sometimes using regression to predict the value from other input features. 
etc. Or uh, we'll use the missing value friendly model, like uh, XD Boost or Light, D Light DBM or any other. So anyway, um, if you make AI, if you want to make AI in some field which requires some explainability or the, the field requires you to handle this kind of missing data, you need to keep this kind of solution in your mind. Then here's sparse modeling that we are using to tackle with this problem. So sparse modeling is not like deep learning. It's not the concrete algorithm. But this is a way to model, the way to think about the model, think about the data. So it could be hard for me to say this is the concrete exact beginning of the sparse modeling, technically. But I would like to say the beginning of the, the latest evolution of sparse modeling began in 1996, invention of Lasso by Tibusilami, who is uh, the pro professor of the, uh, the Stanford University. And then, after seeing the great result of Lasso, uh, the many researchers started to, to apply this idea to various research areas. So the complex sensing in 2006 is one of the most famous application of sparse modeling in the signal processing domain. And this technique reduced the time of taking the, the brain scan of MRI images drastically. And sparse coding in 2008 is famous in uh, neuroscience. And even last year, Michael Ellard proposed a multi-layer convolutional sparse modeling. It's so long name, by the way. And uh, this is a super complicated complicated approach of sparse modeling, but interestingly, he pointed out some relationship between sparse modeling and uh, the deep learning in this paper. So anyway, I like to introduce Lasso, because yeah, Lasso is pretty much simple algorithm, and uh, some of you may all already know this, but yeah, it, it is great, great and good example for you to to get the, the essence of sparse modeling. So uh, let me do that. So uh, lasso can be used, can be applied to a linear regression problem. The, I think you already know linear re what linear regression is, but uh, ju just let me uh, give you some the, uh, the brief information here. So the, in the linear regressions, uh, you gonna, uh, you, you are supposed to estimate the value w in this equation. So y indicates the output or observed data, and x is input to data. Sometimes x is a kind of the information of the, uh, if you are uh, the sales manager of the supermarket, the x will be uh, information of your shop, and y is the, uh, the sales or revenue information. Anyway, the, the purpose of this issue is uh, try to estimate the uh, uh, W to express the, uh, uh, the relationship between the input X and target value Y. And as you can see, we have the length of M weight here, which means we should have M samples because we need to solve this equation, right? And this is a simultaneous equation. If you have unknown value, m unknown value, we need to have m equations to express it, explain it. And uh, the popular method to solve this prob uh, problem is least squares method. And you can solve, uh, you can minimize this uh, objective function. However, if what if you don't have m samples, you cannot solve this problem theoretically analytically. However, here's some solutions. So if you know not all input data of X are irrelevant to the target very Y. So if you can add this kind of assumption to the problem, 
then if the relevant value to the y is less than m, you can solve this problem. This is the essence of the idea of sparse modeling. Then the objective function will be changed to this. We need to add regularization term to objective function to solve this in a mathematical form. And there are several types of the regularization term here. By the way, um, you know, you may know that regularization will be used to avoid overfitting. But interestingly, this will be also applied to tackle with the, uh, the small amount of samples, right? Now, here's the, 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 there are many, many regularization terms, but I'd like to pick just two of them. The first one is L0 norm, and the other one is uh, L1 norm. Um, L0 norm is a completely intuitive, intuitive uh, the regularization. So when you add L0 norm, it will try to find out W to minimize the number of non-zero elements, which means try to try not to use input value x as much as possible. However, to do this, actually you need to check every weight of W one by one. Try to set this one tail, try to set other one del, you, you need to repeat this again and again to get the result. So if the, the dimension of the input features is not so big like two or three, you can solve this problem in your lifetime. But if you have, for instance, 100 dimensional input data, you cannot solve this problem in your lifetime unless you have the uh, super expensive D-wave uh, quantum computing machine, right? So then what Tibushi Rani found out in 1996 is that even relaxing the constraint from L0 to L1, the convergence can be ensured theoretically. So this is a called L1 known optimization. So I will give you some numerical experiment later on, but yeah, L1 norm is not exactly the regulation, regularization for original problem, but it can work. So this is a great invention of the lasso. So to use lasso, there are several options. And I'd like to introduce SPM image here. And uh, yeah, this is a Python library for sparse modeling made by our uh, team members. And uh, this is completely compliant to scikit-learn interface. So if you are familiar with scikit-learn, you can use it uh, very quickly. So this is the example. So upper side is uh, the lasso from scikit-learn, and uh, the lower side is lasso from our own algorithm, uh, from our own implementation. So as you can see, the, the most of the code are same, just uh, the difference is in the, the importing part, right? and the numerical experiment here. So right now, we have the input data with 1,000 dimensional, but we only have 100 samples. So theoretically, this is the unsolvable problem. However, if we can assume the sparsity of the input type data, in this case, only 20 features is relevant to the result we can solve the problem. So blue one is uh, the uh, true data, and uh, the orange one is uh, estimated data by Lasso. So yeah, actually, as you can see, some small difference between the estimated value and the uh, original value, because and we, we, we added some sort of the, uh, the noise to the, the uh, original information. So anyway, you can see how RAS or how sparse modeling, how the idea of sparse modeling works here. So as a result, you can get, it, even if you have the uh, 1,000 dimensional information, you can know that only 20 input features are important for your problem. This is why we call sparse modeling uh, is useful for making AI interpretable or human understandable.
So we can expand this use case to image analysis. So first one is compressive sensing. So we'd like to see same problem from different perspective. So to do this, I just change the notation uh, like this. So Y is observed data, it's same. However, we'd like to estimate X here and A indicates observation. Uh, in other words, A is a a indicates a relationship between the input X, input or X and Y. And right now, X is a kind of the information you wanna see. So let me give you the uh, MRI example. So the raw data you can get from the huge MRI equipment is case space information. You can see in the left side. And uh, you, oh, so it's a bit dark, but the yeah, uh, light side, you can see the MRI images that you are familiar with if you get elderly people. So and, uh, anyway, the, these two information has a relationship like this. So A, in this case, A is Fourier transform. So yeah, once we get the case space information from the medical e equipment, Applying inverse Fourier transform will gives you the MLI. However, if you don't have enough samples of the information in K space, what happened? Same. The inverse transformation will fail. However, again, as you know, MLI image, most of the part of the MLI image is zero. Black. So to say, yeah, ML resulted MRI image is basically sparse. So you can apply completely same idea from last to this problem. So yeah, even small amount of samples in case space domain, we can uh, the reconstruct the image of MRI image. So same technique was used to capture the black hole images called Event Horizon Telescope Project. So this year, uh, yeah, actually you, you, you may know, yeah, the, the, the black hole image was captured. So sparse modeling was used in that, uh, the reconstruction of the image. So um, the, for compressive, sorry, compressed sensing, yeah, we usually, Sometimes we use the simple L0 norm optimization, but yeah, total vari vari variation is also commonly used. So this is a slightly different types of the uh, regularization term. And uh, you can get the, uh, you can make the image smooth while keeping the edge like this. So the left side is original image of the uh, leaf. leaf. And the, 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 the middle one is binalized image. And the, the, the right one is the, uh, uh, we apply the, uh, a total variation to the binalized image. So as you can see, the small noise will, small noise disappears while edge still remains. And the next one is more uh, the machine learning style, uh, the up, uh, application of sparse modeling in image analysis. This is called dictionary learning. So this is similar to deep learning, but dictionary learning is a bit different. So the how we learn the dictionary here. So dictionary is a kind of the data set you can see right side. It's a the the set of the small piece of the images, and how we learn the dictionary right side looks like this. So First of all, we need to extract the part from original images and then try to express this with linear coordination of dictionary basis. And when we train the dictionary, we try to use minimum number of bases to express every phrase of original image. You already have some sense about sparse modeling, right? And then, we, once we have the dictionary like this, you can get the 
uh, the sparse representation of original image. So the, the sparse coding uh, is the, uh, the data to indicate the original, which dictionary basis will be used to represent original image. So we can use this dictionary and the sparse code coding to reconstruct the original image like this. So yeah, actually this technique can be used to denoise, or uh, I, I'd like to give you some more uh, example. And uh, actually this image uh, reconstruction can be expressed in Python like this. So the first step is extract patches from original images and extract simple patches to the, is, uh, the method from the psychic plan and uh, normalize the information and do dictionary learning and the reconstruction at the end. So for dictionary learning, in this example, we are using KSVD. This is one of the algorithms for our dictionary learning. And this is uh, the included in our SPM image. So the, still we are using some libraries of scikit-learn or something, but yeah, we can do this kind of things just in one stride. So it's very simple. And the uh, extended use case of this dictionary learning, I, I'd like to give two examples here. The first one is in painting. So in painting, yeah, we will be given the, some damaged data, like you can see the middle of upper rows. So you don't see anything, almost anything in the middle image, right? However, if you apply dictionary learning and reconstruction, you can reconstruct the image right side. So it's not so super clear, but it, you can identify some food on top of the dishes, right? And the lower part, I'd like to give you that super resolution example. It's quite the same to the, the upper side. So the left side is original image, but you, you don't know this information, by the way. And then you can get the low resolutional image. This time, I, it's a half size of the original image. However, you can do super resolution by using the dictionary learning. So the, as for in painting, I just uh, the, the, uh, 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 extract some important part. And uh, yeah, actually the extract patches is same, but we need to handle the, the, the missing value in the middle. And our KSVD algorithm can handle the missing values uh, like this. So, so to say our KSVD algorithm is uh, the uh, missing value friendly. But to do this, uh, we need to just put some strange value to, to original information anyway. So the last one is anomaly detection. So actually this is an interesting uh, application of this dictionary learning. So in medical, uh, in manufacturing field, uh, we are seeing the issues that customer don't have the image of defective product. So we only have good images. So what we do is try to train the dictionary for, from only good images, which means this dictionary capture the character of the good product. Then, once we get the test image, we use this dictionary to extract this parse code, and also we do reconstruction, and we can calculate PSNL or those any other, other image-related values, and then we can use the standard classifier. So surprisingly, super, super classical classifier can work for this, for some use case. So this is the example of the, uh, that, uh, the defective detection. Yeah, this image is, is uh, a public data set uh, of the solar panel cells. And uh, actually, the, we, we found out that the paper uh, the proposing two methods one is SVM, the other is CNN. And as you can see, we can build the, uh, the AI model uh, from the one-tenth data set, one-tenth size of the data set, and still uh, we are showing the better performance. So, um, 
Yeah, I have another uh, the example of the time series analysis, but yeah, 30 seconds only left, unfortunately. So uh, let me give you some uh, the brief example. So we can apply similar similar idea to time series data, and uh, this is the uh, example of the uh, capturing trend. So red one is the uh, observed information, and the the green one, you cannot see it clearly, but the green one is overlap the blue one. And that we try to capture the trend from the red one. And even we don't, we 80% of data dropped, we can estimate correctly. And the same technology can be used for image analysis here. So summary, so we, it's, Time out, but just let me talk about uh, one, let me give you one last slide here. <coughs> so uh, sports modeling in a nutshell. So um, sports modeling can work with small, even small amount of data set and also it will give you some human understandable result. And since it only needs small amount of data set, it, it, we, we can say lightweight. And uh, we have some, the concrete example of image and the time series data. And it has over 20 years history and uh, you can rely on this technique or method, okay? So thank you, thank you for your joining. <laughs>